what special did you do to get two phd degrees man sold my soul <laughs> hi guys welcome back to the podcast the topic of today's discussion is how to get two phd degrees so i have invited dr sithila thaminamule for this podcast he has got two phd degrees as a quadrilateral phd student from coventry university uk and deakin university australia i got to know seth when i was doing my phd in the same program so it will be a very good discussion let's begin with the video hi seth welcome to the podcast and thanks for giving your time to us man hey deepak it's good to see you again and uh thanks for having me <laughs> it's been a long time yeah it's been a long time man uh so i would like to start with my first question uh, as we all know that you have two phd degrees uh, so what special did you do to get two phd degrees man sold my soul <laughs> <laughs> no no it's it's not that bad it's um yeah it took a lot of sacrifice so for those of you that don't know deepak and i were on the same phd program type so we both know the pains and struggles yeah uh, going through the two phd's but we also know the uh the great elation at the end when you're finally finished yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> you, you you have to pay something if you want to get something right so that's what we did yeah not, nothing nothing comes for free you have to put a lot of hard work in and um whilst it might look like yes we've got two phd's in similar topics it does take yeah. a lot of work on both sides and Exactly. I would say you definitely own it from the amount of work and I think Deepak would probably also say the same thing. Yeah, exactly man, you have to put in a lot of efforts like you have to take care of things from both the sides, you have to put in a lot of effort. So yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, so and I mean I, yeah, so I don't know about you Deepak, but for both of us I think it paid off. Like Deepak obviously you've got your research posting in France. Yeah. Um for you you've guys, your, the, you know. <laughs> yeah, I I, job, I took man, the like, I took the industrial route. uh so nowadays i i shipped it over from where i was and work in denmark um mm-hmm. for uh, one of the large renewable energies companies siemens gamesa renewable energies for what yeah. it's called siemens gamesa renewable energies for now but uh, yeah actually doing this we did get to the places we wanted to be i think right yeah 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 exactly when these uh, this program has actually helped us and especially like you got got to use uh, i think we will talk about it later in our uh, yeah in our podcast so i would want to begin like i would want you to you know tell me something about the program like how different it is uh, from the other phd programs um uh, that we have like all of course like i also know like but what's what's your opinion on that i think it's a lot more intense i don't think it's something that everyone sees from the start like the first thing i'd say is regardless every different person's phd journey is a little bit different nobody has the same process from a to b everyone has their own different challenges but yeah, what right. you don't see with this is that you know say if you took the typical route from start to finish for a phd you'll have your own challenges let's say you have 10 or 15 challenges yeah. when you're doing it on a double program like this that number is multiplied in the sense exactly. that you have twice as many problems and the nature of the problems you have aren't necessarily the same like in both of our cases we had to do ethical discussions about our work in terms of both uh the US and Australia and they're not yes. exactly the same in terms of the way they work so yeah that's the thing you you just have a bit more to do and it's a bit more intense and it requires i'd say a lot more planning depending on how your program's going and how you exactly so that's to do your work you have to be on top of everything and have a plan a a plan b a c and a d as well and maybe <laughs> yeah. like <laughs> keep on making plans until you finish exactly Um, yeah. and you have to be very flexible too um it's not something that everyone can do and even if you're in the same country doing a dual award phd you still have to be able to work with different groups of people you still have to be ready to sort of switch up your plan and to mm-hmm. you know, i mean in the case of what we both had perhaps move countries as well um exactly. it's not there's a lot more challenges but you know because of that you get a lot more opportunities as well Yeah yeah that's right yeah and and also like you have to deal with all this documentation things you have to deal oh, with yeah. both the both the uh, both the universities and also take care of this time difference arrange meetings and everything so yeah i mean it's a bit hectic but at the we end, we, we did not do yeah. ourselves any favors with the time difference did we we ended up with uh, what an 11 hour time difference at its worst so yeah 
you'd um you know you'd sit there you'd do it like for me when i was over in australia i still had to report back to the uk so i'd um finish up in the lab i'd done all my meetings i'd done whatever i needed to do and i'd come home to uh you know have some dinner and i'd sit down at dinner to talk yeah. with my supervisors <laughs> in the uk at the same time and deepak had exactly the same thing <laughs> exactly the same I the used to get up early in the morning like uh, i remember my one of my meetings was at around five o'clock in the morning and uh, one day like uh, uh, one of my supervisors uh, uh, in australia he was awake uh, at around so we were doing our meeting at around 10 o'clock in the night so it was uh, 10 o'clock in australia because mm. we couldn't find any common time so so yeah it was that uh, that bad okay uh, seth uh, could you please talk about uh, the course structure like uh, what kind of um, like courses you have to do in order to complete your credit uh, credit work and all those things so before we get on to that, I think the first thing is to talk about maybe what you need to get before you start your PhD. So yeah. for the UK and for Australia in general, um, you obviously need a bachelor's, but the pro like the preferential thing with this program mm -hmm. was that you'd probably have to have a master's and okay. you needed to have, I think it was, you needed to have a first class equivalent in the research yeah. segment. So yeah. if you're a bachelor's student and you manage to get plus, you know, plus 70%, on your research pro project that qualified you if you were a master student and you had a 70 percent plus um msc program uh research section then that's that's the kind of thing that they were looking for it it's yeah. a case of before you even start you have to start on that sort of term and then when we started between the two universities that we were both part of we realized that each individual course so i mean we can talk about the two that we went to deacon and coventry but it may yeah. change between different other universities yeah. for us we had to so it changed a little bit from when i started and i think deepak was in one of the first tranches that changed um originally when you started you needed to have a certain amount of taught modules that you did for the uk so yeah. you needed a minimum of 10 credits taught um okay. maximum of 30 um yeah. And you also needed to do some research and development. So I'll talk about yeah. the research and development bit after this, but uh, yeah, you had to take you, you had to take some master's level modules that um, would fit with your course. Mm. You also had to take a research integrity and a research methods course that we yeah. all had yeah. to do actually when we started yeah. on both sides. So we had one yeah. separately for Coventry and one separately for Deacon. You can, yeah. And it was to sort of get you into the basics of working with um, different reference libraries, working within the research sphere, trying to get your work sort of shown and getting introduced to journals if you haven't seen that side before. Most yeah. people will, but it's a good refresher. Yeah, exactly. But then there was yeah. the other side of this about research and development. So both myself and Deepak, we had to do different things that made us better as a researcher. So it could be things like going to workshops, um, spending time on working for posters for presentations, going to actual conferences. So, yeah. I mean, both me and Deepak have, you know, put in, well, Deepak's put in papers, I've put in papers, um, and, you know, I've done a AAA conference myself. All those things, for every 100 hours you put in, you earn 10 credits. And 10 you, needed credits, a minimum yeah. of, you needed a minimum of 10 credits to fulfill the criteria. Um, yeah, yeah. The separate side of this was that for Australia, we also had a an independent research plan so we had to sort of show how we'd grown from start to finish as a researcher as an as an addendum to our v, uh, our um thesis so at the end of it we'd have to say this is what we did to achieve the goals that we set out in the first place this is how we've got better as a researcher because this phd process is not just about like you know you solve a subject you also have to show that you've got the transferable skills so exactly. in yeah. some ways it's kind of good to do it right it's yeah 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 that's right and also like in order to cover these credits we we could also use if let's say for example if we have written a proposal you can also write uh, that i spent this much time to write the proposal and this is the result and everything and uh, then you can uh, uh, you know cover all those credits from from but for me um, i think i did not do any of the coursework coursework i think uh, that you as you said and I could mm. put all these credits using my research activities, for example, attending the workshops, conferences, writing proposals, papers, and all those things. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had the same thing. So I got I got a lot of research development credits from, I was a bachelor's and master's project level supervisor. Uh, it's like, yeah. a, you know, so I helped out with supervision. Obviously, I wasn't lead supervisor. I had a, I had a lead supervisor that I worked with. 
I did some um, some teaching work whilst I was at the university, which was also towards my, you know, sort of academic um, development. And then there were, so I think you did some as well, Deepak, but I did a bit of a consultancy too, which also led into that. Yeah, so, I, 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 yeah I also supervised a few masters and bachelor students. Yeah, I mean, but I did not use them to cover because I already had like enough. Uh, he he had so many credits, he didn't need to worry about it. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the thing. I didn't have to put all those things. Uh, uh, so, but for, but, but for both of us, we needed to have something that we could um, use to the talk credit module. It's changed a little bit in the new program structure, but they don't have to do that. But uh, for both of us, we needed to look at either taking a talk course module. So yeah. we there were some master's level modules that we could take or some research level modules or yep. we could do depending on your university and your background you can have a acquired prior knowledge transfer so you exactly, can yeah. transfer your credits and obviously with me being a uk masters there was an equivalency for deepak you can get an equivalency from an uh, an indian masters but you have to sort of show the criteria and everything there's yeah i did that. very helpful about it yeah yeah I, I did that it was quite easy for me to you know convert those uh, credits mm. uk credits uh, it was very easy okay seth uh, let's uh, let's start with a positive note uh, let's talk about the advantages of these program like uh, what do you think are major uh, advantages if you go for this course okay. um where do we start with this one so obviously with any phd you're going to get project management as a huge advantage that you have to learn how to manage a project and get from start to finish and yeah. how to keep all of your stakeholders happy so yeah when we say stakeholders, there's the external stakeholders in terms of actually the people that run the program that want to kick to that point, but you've also got your internal stakeholders. Yeah. For me and Deepak, we had five supervisors, six supervisors at points. Six, yeah. And we had to, yeah, we had to keep all of them happy and they're all yeah. different people. And exactly. you learn that there are different ways to work with different people. So you learn like, okay, this person wants a very direct to the point thing. And this person mm -hmm. wants a full in-depth explanation of what's going on. So you'll have to take some more time. And yeah. sometimes when you have different people in different meetings, you have to have a balance of what happens in terms of different places. Yeah. And then there's another stakeholder. And I think it's accentuated within this pro program and this process that um, any PhD, you've also got to manage yourself to the finish line. So you've got to get a good work balance with, you know, um, not going over hours. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those people that was very good at doing that one. Uh, I learned <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> yeah. I had deep, I had Deepak telling me to stop working at points. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, there's another side of it that you have to learn how to manage yourself to get to that point. And yeah. um, how to use your time efficiently. Sometimes you might find that you get meeting requests for things like department meetings or for, mm -hmm. you know, workshop meetings. And sometimes you just have to say, do you know what? I don't have the time for this. I, yeah. I, I had to decline it. And exactly. funnily enough, it comes up in my, my professional job too. I'm in a position with my, uh, with the company that I currently work for SGRE that, uh, yeah. we, we have said that it's okay if you have too much on to, um, not be involved in these things. If you need yeah. to get time to do the work you need to do, then that's what you have to do. Yeah. That's one side of it. Um, the other things that you kind of get used to are, I would say this one's a bit specialist for us. Um, and I have a bit more experience than this over Deepak, but Deepak yeah. obviously had to do part of this because Deepak moved to the UK for his PhD. Yeah. Um, in my last five years, I have spent my time now in three different countries because I was obviously in the UK when I started. I dragged myself over to Australia for one year to do my research. Um, it's meant to go back again. That's a different yeah. story. That would be thanks to COVID. <laughs> um, but uh, funnily enough, I finished off this job and uh, the um, work at the university and this job opportunity turned up for me um, looking at, you know, moving to another country that I'd never been to, Denmark. Yeah. And because of what I'd gone through with this PhD and because I'd had to get used to setting up in two different um, countries, yeah. I was really well, like, I was actually really very well prepared to just up sticks and move. It was something yeah. that it didn't seem as much of a daunting challenge anymore. And because I'd been through that process, I knew what to do. You get a huge amount of international exposure because on top of the extra conferences and everything you do, you are working with two completely different kinds of people and different uh, sides of culture. Yeah. And I think the thing is that you get this advantage that you get the perspective of being able to look at both. 
So yeah. I think Deepak could probably tell you even in some of the podcast bits that he's doing himself, yeah. that there are lessons that we both learn that we took back to, you know, where we were going to go. We might take in with us with the, in the future, that there's differences in working culture, differences yeah. in how people spend their time outside. Like those things are important. Yeah. And apart from that, like for, uh, for, for me, because I had, I mean, you also had five supervisors. I had six supervisors and everybody was giving me like a treating me different way. And also everybody had a different way of thinking and everybody had like a dip. So for example, in, in terms of writing, they all had like a different uh, way of writing. They all had a different preference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, pre- different preferences. And then you you actually understand what what, what are the important and the adv- like things that you can, you know, incorporate in yourself. And then you can bring those styles or everything, whatever you like to your style. And then you can get to know the, you know, uh, the opinions and the understanding of different people, how they, how they approach research problems. Right. Mm. So this is one thing which I learned from my supervisors, and uh, uh, yeah, sometimes it's about very difficult to to get like six opinions, but yeah, somehow like you you get to learn a lot. That that's the main thing. And Deepak, not kidding. Sometimes you've got one supervisor says I want this, and then the other one goes, no, no, no actually, I want the exact opposite. And you're thinking, right, and then well, I have to keep then, both people happy. What do I do? Yeah, exactly. That, that's what I'm saying. Like you learn the technique or like the trick to handle these kind of situations. How to deal with like all the like uh, opposite comments, I can say, like opposite opinion. Mm. How do you deal with them? And you also have like, you don't have like, and also like you have to make sure that you don't, you know, piss off any, any one of them. Right. So how you, how do you, how, how you respond to those comments and how you respond, how to, how you write the email to just ask for their opinion and all these things. You learn these things. Right. So this was very, I think, I think that's the thing that we, we, we both learn the hard way how to maintain a balance between all of our stakeholders and exactly. you do it on a normal phd but for both of us and for our colleagues that did this as well mm-hmm. we all had the the challenge multiplied by the fact that we doubled the amount of factors in and exactly. there were things that you wouldn't see in just a normal one university track system yeah. and being honest like some people on this program they've also got industrial inputs and that brings a yeah, whole yeah. new dimension because exactly. industrial supervisors suddenly have a very different idea about what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also like you, because you were involved with two universities, you can use the best side of the, like best part of the university. For example, if something, some uh, like uh, mm. one is famous for like, uh, like uh, one type of like research and the other is famous for one type of research. This is what well, I, that's, uh, that's it. Even actually on the simple side, like when we said that you, you get a really big sort of, chunk of project management to do some yeah. of it will be a case of where do i do each piece of work and how do i do it and what time do i have allotted to this so in my exactly. case i worked in um nanoparticle um modification of uh, thermoplastics yeah. and i found out that in one university we didn't have the health and safety rating for me to do the manufacturing but the yeah. other university had all the bits that i needed yeah. with very strict h and s rules um yeah. about what we could do but I had to design on my work to say, okay, well, I need to be out in Australia to do this piece of work. And I have to have everything ready by this time so that when I come back to the UK, I can do the testing with the extra equipment I have here. And, you know, these are all challenges that you don't necessarily see. And let's not even start on health and safety paperwork. Like both me and Deepak, Deepak had a really, really long process. A long process, yeah, many filling there. It took me ages to do all this health and safety thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and another one of our colleagues, uh, so she, um, a colleague of ours, Erica, who was on the same course, she um, she had a different factor that she had to work with um, people. She was doing interviews yeah. and all that kind of thing. And suddenly it gets complicated because the GDPR rules are not the same in the UK and Australia. So yes. you you end up being immersed into this completely different side of project management than you would see in a normal phd Obviously, and because yeah. of that you need to you need to really be on the ball yeah yeah that's right yeah okay uh so let's move on and and we have talked talked about the positive aspects now let's talk about the disadvantages would you really call them the disadvantages or do they actually teach you something like so let's talk about disadvantages Okay, so disadvantages, there, there are maybe some. So one of them is um, if you're on a program like mine was where you're expected to travel, mm. you have to be prepared for the fact that you can't really settle anywhere. So yeah. one of those disadvantages is you can't sit there and go and get a three-year lease um, on somewhere um, 
you have to be prepared. Like, so neither myself nor Deepak were in that position at the time. But um, yeah. if you have a family, for example, you have to be prepared to make that sacrifice that you'll be away from your family for a period of time. It did yeah. come up for another student on this program. Um, yeah. It may be the case that, you know, you may have to sit there and realize that I'm going to have to leave certain things in certain countries or I'll have to come to agreements about certain things. So that you lose a little bit of the, um, the flexible cases you have because you're stuck with the constraints of your program. Yeah, That's probably exactly. maybe the biggest disadvantage I'd say that maybe it's difficult to settle, but everything else, I wouldn't really call it a disadvantage. I'd say maybe it, it really was a lesson that you learned. Yeah. So um, yes, you, you have to sit there and work a lot harder because you're working at different hours of the day. But because yeah, of yeah. that, you learn a bit more about how to be a bit more efficient with your time, hopefully. It's a, yeah. it's a hard lesson to learn. Yeah. But you suddenly learn like, oh, if I have to be up at four o'clock in the morning for this meeting that we can't get out of, then yeah. perhaps I need to make sure that I'm focused so that I can spend that time. And I'm not taking away time from somewhere else. Exactly. Um, yeah. You and whilst I said moving around is, is a bit of a disadvantage, you know, it's also a lesson about being prepared and flexible to to deal with any challenges that comes across. And it, this isn't like a normal nine to five PhD. This is something where you have to be ready and flexible and yeah. it kind of maybe mirrors some of the industrial real life problems that you might see that sometimes yeah. even in my job, I'll get a call from like a different plant globally that says, um, we're having a problem with this. Can you help us with this and this? And you just have to sit there and manage the expectations and say, yes, I can do this or no, can we do this in the morning or, you know, those yeah. kinds of things. So the, dis the only disadvantages are that you're going to, it's a lot of work. You have to put in a bit of extra effort for it, but the skills that you develop as a result of doing that extra work, I'd say that when you come to the end of it and you finally put everything in and you, you get told like, oh yeah, you know, you're getting a PhD and everything, you suddenly yeah. realize actually this was all worth something. Yeah. As long as you're committed to this, you know, as a thing, then you, there's you, nothing really to lose from doing this. Yeah, you just have to be at those three, three and a half years. That's it. <laughs> Somehow you have to manage that. And then afterwards, it's all fun and you get the benefits. Maybe the only other thing I'd say was a disadvantage. I managed to find ways to do it. And I think Deepak did too. You, If you're looking at an academic career in the future, so if you're looking to be like a, a lecturer, moving up to a senior lecturer, because mm -hmm. you're in different places at different times, maybe you have to be a bit more... Uh, you, you need, need to think a little bit outside the box in terms of getting the teaching credentials and capability that you have. So it might be a case of you need to be yeah, flexible yeah. about what semesters you do. Yeah, um, it's not right. the same as other people where they're suddenly like, oh, you know, I'm teaching this semester and I'm back next semester and the next one. You might suddenly switch where you are within a semester or you might have a completely different um, research pool that requires you to be somewhere else um and look sometimes the semester times don't match up either so you have to be very careful about that thing that's maybe the only other disadvantage i could say but i wouldn't say that it's not impossible because both myself and deepak got significant yeah. teaching experience actually before we left exactly yeah so, yeah. yeah and we all, i mean we were also uh, trained on teaching and learning by the the, the higher education academy the uk yes we got the yeah. we got the benefits of both sides so yes. deepak Actually, unlike me, Deepak managed to get some of the courses okay. under his belt. Yeah. I just got I just got thrown in the yeah. deep end. <laughs> I just got thrown in the deep end. Hey, can you do this? It's like, yeah, okay, no worries. <laughs> um, but no, no, you do get that opportunity. And it's a case of yeah. managing what you want to get out of it. And yeah. because your time constraints are a bit more, you know, sort of um, a bit more sort of, uh, well, they're constrained, to be honest. That's the only word I can use. Yeah, yeah. You, um, you need to think a little bit more about how you're going to get from point A to point B. So the yeah, same yeah. way as we said earlier, it's just a case of being flexible and being prepared. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, good points, Seth. Uh, let's move on. Like as we have already spoken about uh, the large team that we had to the, that we had to handle throughout our PhD. One of the things which I wanted to ask was like, uh, what are the ways or some of the tricks or techniques that you can tell people how to manage like a large team when they are dealing with large teams, especially when you're dealing with like a two different continents. Okay. I think the first thing is that you need to understand everybody that you're speaking to. So 
for instance, you know, if you've got a supervisor that doesn't have a family and is a bit more flexible, maybe you can push them to um, move their time schedule to fit what you need to do. But if they've mm -hmm. got family commitments, you can't really ask them to do that. So you have to start saying, well, this is the priority times for them. So I think the first thing that I did when I was trying to set up meetings, and it took a while to work it out, was, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> sorry, um, was to determine what times everybody was free and say, well, yeah. around your your commitments and what you have to do what yeah. times can we work with that we can get yeah. everybody to sit down for an hour and you know everybody we started polling things and i think deepak you you had the same problem and obviously sometimes you'll realize that people have to make sacrifices other than yourself so you then have to work with their supervisors to say okay i know that you can't do this time because of this can we maybe flexibly move this by half an hour yeah. so that we can make this work um that's one of the first things you need to do um the second thing is as i said it, it kind of feeds into this understanding who you're speaking to you yeah. need to work on building a rapport with the people that you work with yeah. so that you understand what they're looking for and you understand what their objectives are yeah. um that takes time it's not something that you can walk straight into you you may learn it by you know sitting there and spending time in the office or it might be something that you learn if you like if you're like me where i could go for a beer with my supervisors or something just to have a chat about something it yeah. could be that you learn that outside yeah that's right and <laughs> at the same time you have to give them an insight into what you're like so you have to decide how much information you want to disclose about um how you're feeling who you are and actually to be honest my my take on this is honesty helped me there was no point in me hiding my problems so if there was something that was bothering me yeah. it made a lot more sense to say to somebody this is where we work Mm -hmm. um other yeah. than that what i would say is you also have to learn the different styles that people want so if somebody wants a direct answer yeah. don't send them a <coughs> sorry like, like a big <laughs> don't send them an essay yeah <laughs> yeah I, I i'm i'm terrible for it but like you know i had to yeah i know man like when you told when you told me about your thesis that you have written this much i said like where did you come where did you bring <laughs> all those words man <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, uh, one of the things which I wanted to mention was uh, uh, I I actually the beginning I uh, figured it out that it's better to have a one pick one supervisor from both the sides and have more meetings with them before you have a meeting with everyone. You know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is one of the things which I want I used to do. And uh, if what like let's say if one of them like one of those six supervisors used to say like uh, this is wrong, this is right. Then most of them used to say the same thing, ninety to ninety but five percent of the time, right? So these well, are the things which uh, which uh, help me. I'd give you something else on that as well. So one of the other things I said when I said about understanding your supervisors and stakeholders was, we all had to learn what each one of our supervisors was best at. And I was very mm -hmm. lucky that the five supervisors I had within my project, each one was very specifically good at something that worked within the project yeah, that i yeah. created so i yeah, knew when exactly. it came to it that if i needed an answer i go to this one so if it's about yeah. mdt i'd go to my supervisor at coventry um dr yeah. james griffin and say okay what do we do if it was about epoxy modification mm. i'd be going to professor russell barley at um mm. deacon saying okay you're the expert in this i need to hear your opinion over everybody else's because you're the one that knows the most about this subject yeah yeah exactly yeah this is what i actually did um, I mean, it helped me with, with my thesis uh, review as well. When I wrote the chapters, I actually sent one chapter to like one one supervisor at the beginning, and yep. then like uh, sent the like, entire thesis to everybody, and then asked for their review. And it was quite quick for me at that way. Yeah. Okay, Seth. Let's talk about some other uh, cotitel programs if you are aware about apart from the Co the Coventry and the Deacon one. Yeah, yeah. So there's um there's similar programs. I mean, there was one going between Warwick and uh, I think it was uh, Monash at the time that we were doing this. Um, okay. I've seen some other ones involving the states and the UK. So I've seen I think it was Bournemouth and uh, one of the uh, universities in Boston. And look, even within Coventry, it wasn't just us yeah. that were on this program. Like after we did it, there were details for courses with um. The A Star Institute in Singapore. There were yeah. deals with um, oh, who else was there? There was the South African University as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a similar thing going on with uh, Denmark actually with Arbus. Mm -hmm. um, okay. There's this is becoming a new thing, um, you know, because it 
gives researchers the best of both worlds and the best of both funding pots. So there's more and more of these on the rise. I uh, I haven't personally been looking enough to be able to say that there's many of these, but I mean, yeah, you'll yeah. see more and more of these coming up. Yeah, I mean, there are many programs like this. I don't know if they are exactly the same as Cotton program as what we did. Uh, yeah. uh, there are many in India, for example, Deakin University also has collaborations with IIT Madras and IIT right. Hyderabad. And uh, there is this uh, IIT Bombay and Monash uh, uh, program. But I don't know if they're exactly the same as what we So have. they're all different. Okay. They're all different. Some of them yeah. like, so I had colleagues that had um, a deal between Deakin and I, it's called the Energy Research Institute now, right? Isn't it the Tata Terry Institute? Yeah, yeah TFR. Uh, TFR. Okay, Terry, it's in, it's in Delhi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Terry had a deal at the time with Deakin. So plenty of people I was working with had come across. And yes, okay. they rewarded the PhD from Deakin. Um, but they were working in Terry at the same time as well. So, but every single one is a little bit different. And you, I think before you start any of these courses, just read the rubric to make sure that you understand what you're expected to do and what the outcomes you're looking for are. So in our case, we had two separate PhDs. Some yeah. people would get a joint PhD or it was just joint one PhD. PhD. Yeah. 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 And then like both the logos and like universities and everything with their, yeah. Exactly. Okay, Seth, uh, my next question to you is, which is like, I think the important question, what are the things that people should look for uh, uh, when people are looking for PhDs like uh, these uh, quadrant programs or the joint programs? Okay, I think the first thing is know what you want. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the same story for a normal PhD as well. Um, some people want to do this as a way to access academia. Some people want to do this as a way for a professional, um, you know, uh, like role within a company as an industrial side. And some people are doing this because maybe it's the subject that speaks to them. I'm personally one of the latter. Uh, Deepak, what was your feel on this? I think you were also one of the latter. It was more about what you were doing that was the Yeah, yeah, that was driver. important. Yeah, yeah. But um, yes, when you start this, you should know what you're looking for for any PhD, but for these specifically, there are some other little bits that uh, uh, add some, uh, let's put it some spice into the curry pot as they were. <laughs> um, like for example, depending on what countries you're looking at, perhaps yep. your professional opportunities and <clears throat> your academic opportunities will change as a result because you'll have training within those different fields and environments. Yeah. So say if you're looking for something in terms of getting further employment opportunities in the UK, <clears throat> learning the academic side of um, the UK can be advantages, um, yeah. advantageous rather, um, the same for Australia. But it doesn't mean that that's the end, the be all end all in terms of everything. It doesn't stop you from going anywhere else. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, one second. Um, the one thing I would say though, is that you definitely need to make sure that you like your subject because yeah. There's this well-known thing that people say about PhDs that you have something called the um, the PhD blues second year. So you get to your second year of doing this and you've been struggling through this whole thing and you suddenly realize like, oh, life's a bit more difficult. What do I do? Yeah. And when you get to that point, um, you suddenly have to find something deep, deep down to keep yourself going. And if you really don't like what you're doing as a subject, yeah it becomes so much more difficult because with this the program as a whole throws up different challenges so for instance you know for Deepak it could be that you, you know, he came over to the UK and perhaps after a year he sat there thinking oh, I'm a bit homesick, I will be going to Australia you know. and homesick I'll be going to Australia and then I have to deal with all the visa processes a lot of other stuff yeah, it's very difficult. Well, that, that's it. That's the other thing. So before you start as well, you should really check to make sure that you're all good with the visa processes too, because um, it doesn't stop you from doing your work, but it does change your project track if you can't get like access to certain things. It delays and, your um, project. It delays your project and actually doing the paperwork for it can take a lot of time and you need exactly. to have things ready and in place. So um, I'd say... The first thing for me, if I was in that position of looking at, looking at this again, and I'd do this again, just for the record, I'd do a program like this without a problem, mm -hmm. is I need to make sure that I like the subject. Otherwise, there's no point in me spending that time on it. Because, right? yeah. you know, if I'm going to sit there and spend time in another country yeah. um, and deal with the challenges of moving somewhere new, somewhere maybe that I've never been before, 
maybe somewhere that I'm not comfortable with the language. I also have to yeah. be happy with what I'm doing to be able to push through those moments. Exactly. Then it's a case of looking at where do I want to go in terms of professional and personal development. Um, yeah. You know, where, what, what, what is it that I'm looking for as outputs? And then it's a case of what do I need to do to get there? So, you know, if you're looking at these kinds of programs, then start looking at it earlier about what kind of visa requirements you'd need to do and what requirements yeah. you have, and then ask the universities for support with your applications because they will help yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, That's I, you know, universities are quite helpful in these things. I think you mentioned a very good good point here uh, about like just to know what you want to do actually. And uh, another thing that I can add here is if you want, if you're sure that you want to do this thing, then also make sure that you have the right facilities uh, at both the universities where you're going. Because one of the things that I was struggling with, uh, because I my my visa thing uh, gave me a hard time. So that's why, like, I had to struggle with the, my project was kind of delayed. I had to, like, uh, you know. Oh, poor, poor I remember. He <laughs> came to me asking, how did you get the visa to go to Australia? Sorted? And I had to walk through the process with him. It was, it was really Yeah, yeah, you were very helpful, man, that those days. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you have to, uh, you have to depend on someone to do things for you, which actually delays your work, right? For example, if you need some things from other university, but somehow you're not able to go there. You have to make sure that your things are in place in both the places, like wherever these, you know, programs are. So yeah, this is one thing which uh, which I I felt like uh, quite annoying for me. <laughs> no, it's 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 painful. I think for everybody, you know, you have to you have to. This is also why we said earlier that you need to have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C because plan C. when things don't okay. go the way that you want them to be, you have to be ready to come up with a solution. And actually. To Deepak's credit, the solution that they came up with was a very decent one. That Deepak would effectively say, "This is what I want done from yeah. you know the supervisors in Australia," and yeah. then they tasked research specialists to help him make it happen. So they yeah. created the materials that Deepak wanted and sent them across. And in that yeah, way, yeah. it was still using the best of both universities, but we looked at it from a completely different aspect and a different yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. Actually, like I had to cut down one of my chapters because I couldn't go there and prepare the sample. So I have mm. to, you know, take another turn and just like uh, do something else instead of what I was supposed to do. But anyhow, like I had to finish my PhD, so I, I finished it somehow. <laughs> now I have two degrees. <laughs> two degrees, yes. <laughs> I see. Deepak's got a bit further than me. I'm still still waiting for the final confirmation that everything combined is all set and settled because. Uh, I'll be honest with you, actually, in Deepak's case, Deepak found a workaround. I think if it had been, in my case, this PhD couldn't have happened with just my UK university in tow. It would have been impossible with what I was trying to do. And mm. in some ways, I had to use the best of both sides. So I had to use the extensive carbon fiber and uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymer knowledge that Deacon had, yeah. along with the NDT processes at Coventry to make a success of this project in one way or another. Yeah. So yeah. that's the this other thing. DPAC is absolutely right about facilities. You have to be sure that you know that you have the ability to do what you want when you start. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, let's come to the fun part. Uh, <laughs> let, let's share the personal and the professional experience that we had uh, throughout our journey. So let's start with the interesting one because obviously I'm speaking to you with Deepak and for those of you that don't know me and Deepak, got to know each other on this course. So yeah. I started, I think maybe three months before Deepak did on this course. And, you know, remember Deepak, like his you know, supervisor came to me and said, um, you know, um, can Deepak contact you if there's any problems? And I said, yeah, sure. And actually <laughs> we, we went through like, you know, for Deepak, it was a case of, right, me and this other person have gone through all these challenges. So me and this other student, um, Dr. Erica Cheryl Amber, she's actually got a PhD as well. Yeah. Um, she, we both had to work through all the challenges at the beginning because we were told you guys are the guinea pigs for this I was, program. <laughs> yeah. I, I was the one who was, just, yeah. I was the one who was making sure that I'm uh, getting benefits from your, from your efforts <laughs> that you're doing already and before me. But it's absolutely fine. And that's what we were, we were, we were happy to do that because we knew that we didn't want somebody else to go through those challenges. That was yeah. the, that was the goal that we wanted to make life a little bit easier for the people that came behind us. And, um, yeah. you know, me and Deepak, we obviously got to know each other. We spent time in like, um, you know, Carpentry together. 
there was a lot of chat even whilst I was in Australia to sort of sit there and work out what we could do. And I was helping Deepak out with our, you know, with um, who maybe to speak to and yeah. what we could do in terms of bits there and how to get through the um, uh, the processes on the other side with Australia. Um, yeah. Yeah. So personal side like we ended up creating a little group I think within the university of people that were on the same thing and we all we all sort of chatted and we all used each other as sort of like a forum to ask like uh, you know what I've got the this questions. problem does anyone know how to deal with this yeah. um, and we started a little community in the end um, yeah. it did make life interesting because you know that's probably the only constant that we necessarily had through our PhD yeah. processes because um, you know the minute that I shifted to university, I had to go and find a brand new set of friends. And I don't mean it in a bad way. Like it's just you move to a new country. Yeah, but you made I'll... different. You you have a bigger network than me because I couldn't go there. <laughs> True, but I I'll share the I'll share the fact and actually like I'll stand by it that you know for three months I I actually really struggled because I was mm. at a cultural difference with Australia. Um, yeah, it's coming into this department that I knew nobody from. I didn't have any prior sort of links to it and. Mm. You know, it took me three months to break things down and start finding how I wanted to spend time personally uh, in mm -hmm. terms of that time there. So, you know, we talked about challenges and things. These are those other kinds of sides to it. So your personal yeah. experience is really different to what other people will see. Because yes. say in Deepak's case, if Deepak had gone to Australia, Deepak had to do it once. I'm, I'm a home student from the UK, so it's a little bit easier for me. But mm, yeah. the Deepak, Deepak had nobody here, if I'm right. He didn't have any relatives or anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Deepak had to start fresh on this side. And then if Deepak had gone to Australia, he'd have had to do the same thing all over again. And yeah. it's great because you get to meet a wealth of different people. You get to explore different cultures. Um, you know, you get to explore like two new countries, especially if you're coming from outside your host institution. And, you know, that's that's fantastic in some ways but it makes it challenging in terms of the personal yeah. side. However, at the yeah. same time, the people you meet from this, because you only meet them for so long, yeah. you end up investing a lot more time with them. So you know that when you leave, you still, you still have the ability to talk. It's, I still talk yeah, to my really, friends from Deacon, you know, even though I'm not anywhere near them these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you make friends when you move from countries to country, like country to country. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, they, and they remain your friend throughout your life. And then like you, because you're going for research and you can, you know, collaborate later on whenever you, you know, you, you, you have a permanent position and whenever you have like, uh, whenever you need them. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's uh, in a way it's useful uh, in a way, like it, it's a bit difficult, as you said, like in terms of your, you have to restart everything, you know, and it takes a bit of a time to adjust and you understand the country's culture and about but it's a it's a skill it's a real skill and a skill. i would say this um because we obviously asked this question with the um the frame of professional experience as well that uh on a personal side yes we we had our challenges and we had the wins from that in the sense that we've made different friends like look even now i'm what ten thousand miles away from deepak and deepak can still give me a call without any problems and we can talk about yeah. things yeah. But so, we also, on a professional level, we're, well, we're not 10,000 miles now because you're in France, <laughs> but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but on a professional level, we also got this different skill that, um, look, and I mentioned, I, I now work for Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy in Denmark. I've never yeah. been to Denmark before I started this job. Um, and instantly, because of the challenges that I had in Australia with, on the personal side in terms of getting friends and everything, which was also for the people that I worked with, Mm -hmm. I knew what to expect when I went over to Denmark, to Aalborg, and started working there. And actually, in some ways, I probably did better this time around because I think within about three weeks or something, I could, you know, I was, you know, sort of integrating with the office quite easily. And I was also ready with the fact that I knew that there were differences in expectations between people. So on a professional level, learning to deal with people from different cultures really prepared me really well actually for this new yeah year. yeah i was ready to move and switch shift into something else and i think deepak you probably saw the advantages too in france yeah yeah exactly man like i mean once you have this experience of like shifting country you actually adjust very easily i mean here in mm. for me uh the language language is another problem uh but you know um, i've adjusted quite well here over here and i i now know like how to deal with people 
uh, how to like uh, take care of myself if even if nobody is around me so all these things you learn uh, when you shift from one place to other so i, I think it's a, it's a good thing in a way that you you need to do that and also now i have different uh, people from different different uh, friends from different different countries so, you know it it's useful to me anyhow and you get to learn different new culture so you learn something about their like so you learn uh, something about their culture also so so it's in a way it's a good for you in a, in a way it's a good thing for you i think i feel like a more well rounded and aware person after doing that, this process than i was yeah. before yeah yeah that's right yeah okay so uh, i have a last question for you which is uh, uh, do you have any advice uh, for people those who are, those who are looking for phd's uh, in general and also phd's uh, uh, if, uh, from for the, these kind of programs so um i think the first thing i say is a general comment but it's especially important for this as we said earlier mm-hmm. is you need to really like and have an interest in what you do mm-hmm. when you pick a topic and i'm just saying this is a general phd thing but it it means more in this you can read a topic and say do i is it that i actually want to sit there and just get the three letters behind my name and the two letters before or yeah. do i want to do this because i want to solve a problem and you probably get the most out of this if you pick a phd with a question that you really really want to answer so for me when i came to this phd i just finished off a masters at queen's university belfast um so i was in aerospace engineering masters before moving on to this phd yeah and my phd uh, my phd project question actually fit off really well with where my masters research project ended so i was working with um he's not there anymore but uh, dr andrew hamilton from uh-huh. um, queen's who's now at southampton and he was from the uh illinois group um in terms of self healing materials and i'd done some work with um uh thermoplastics and carbon fiber for self healing materials yeah and ironically where i finished my masters this phd suddenly turned up and uh, it's actually my mother that sent me this and said um maybe you should look at this yeah. and i just sat there and looked at it and thought this is exactly the question that i left open at the end of this that this is possible yeah. and i knew exactly what i wanted to do when this question came up and i was like i have to solve this because this will bug me for years and eat away at me if i never get an answer <laughs> yes it's true that like the the answer was far more complicated than maybe i thought it was in the first place but that's also okay because at the end of the yeah. day i was motivated to find that answer the the deepak and i in phd definitely yeah yeah deepak and i have definitely met people that maybe i don't know whether we should say this deepak but we know people that have perhaps done a phd just because they wanted the phd yeah. and it's not necessarily about the question and because you don't have that passion they really really struggled but, i think when it got difficult uh, yeah i was about to say that those people those who do it just for the name sake they actually struggle because you know phd basically it's not that easy uh, it you know you have to put in some efforts you will not get it like oh it's, it's not like a masters or like a bachelors degree that you will just do some things and then you will get it you have to actually put in efforts you've to, got to earn it yeah you got to earn it yeah yeah you're right because i mean we didn't talk much about this but say for example one of those things that you do have on this program which is even more challenging than a normal program is you have to do a combined defense and your combined yeah. defense actually means that you have to defend against the protocols for both universities yeah. and it can be different for different places like you know i know from some of my colleagues and some of my friends that the us is a is an open defense so you may have to sit there and present to your department and then yeah. you know you, there's all sorts of questions if it's the the netherlands so i have a couple of colleagues at the moment that i work with from delft they have an open defense as well where everybody from the department comes in for 20 minutes you do a presentation you have to field questions from all of them and then they go back to their panel at the end and yeah. you know in that process sometimes you um you have to struggle a little bit to get to that you know sort of that level and if you're not gives, passionate about what you do it, it gives you con- it gives you confidence also because you are facing a lot of a uh, lot of people in, during the exam your 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 viva or defense I mean I think the thing to look with any PhD is you need to like enjoy what you're looking at as I was saying because you know at the end of the day when you have to defend this it's not something that's like a it's not something like a normal you know masters project or a bachelor's project you really have to have earned it and you know you have to be willing to defend it 
And I think the hardest thing about getting there is that if you start struggling in terms of not necessarily having the interest or anything, um, it becomes more of an uphill challenge to be able to get to that point. And I'd also put the caveat here, and I'm not, you know, I know what the point of this is to sit there and tell some of our, your listeners about doing a PhD. I'd say this from also having some teaching experience with masters and bachelor's students. A PhD isn't necessarily a must have. It's something that you do because you perhaps want to get to an answer. That's, there's a reason why not everyone has one. It's something that takes a lot of dedication and time. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with stopping at a master's and saying, this is the level that I want to finish. Even at a bachelor's, if you think I'm getting to the, I'm getting to the point of where I want to be. Exactly. Then there's nothing wrong with that. But if you feel like you have a bit more development and you want to get to that point of getting into something a bit more um, meaty in terms of research, then this is also something for you. I personally remember from my bachelor's and my master's, I, one thing I loved about my master's was my research project. Mm -hmm. I never got that freedom to do that within um, what I did as a bachelor student. It's just not, it's not really specced into a program apart from your project. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that side. And I remember looking at like jobs actually after it's coming out and I really wanted to work in research and development, R&D. And, &D. and yeah. uh, you know, it wasn't that easy to do with just the bachelors. You didn't have the skills that you needed. And part of the reason I looked at the PhD as well was that yes, I had this burning desire for the specific question that we were talking about. But I also wanted to develop the skills to get to that point of being able to have that open capability to have, you know, somebody come to me with a problem and I can suggest a solution. And actually, in some ways, that's now happened for me because I do that within my job now. Um, yeah. I know me and Deepak have a slightly different track in terms of I went to an industrial side, but my industrial side, I work with production support in terms of solutions engineering. I also do work for next generation product line developments so you know i have to effectively facilitate certain things happening and yeah. when it comes to it i suddenly have you know i've got people that come to me even in the last couple of weeks that have said um so we've got this problem how do we solve this and i'll look through and say okay this is what i know this is what i can find out this is what we do know this is what i'll have to do and because of the research skills that i've built for my phd I can look at it with that sort of side of saying, okay, this is where we have a knowledge gap. This is where we need to sit there and do some extra tests. This is why this product option won't work. This is why we need to use something else. I probably couldn't have done that without having done a PhD. Um, yeah, yeah, those skills yeah. were taught to me through this process. And yeah. it's not something that people teach you straight up. You, you learn it from experience yeah. with your supervisors. Yeah. You yeah. learn it from that, but it's a lot of baptism by fire in PhDs, at least on a scientific level. There's a lot of, you do this, something goes wrong, you need to figure out why you need to come up with a solution. It's yeah. very, very rare. It does happen that some people have a perfect project that goes from start to finish and they never see, a, see an oh, issue. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's but, sort of like, so you, you, you see a different problem, like sometimes your machines won't be working, sometimes your materials won't be de delivered on time, sometimes you won't be able to understand something, sometimes you will like, uh, you know, you do, you'll do your experiment or simulation wrong, and like uh, you, so. So you have to, so one thing which I would say, uh, like uh, if, about like look like someone who's looking for PhD is, if you're really interested in doing research, you should go for PhD. And yeah. also yeah. because one of the things that I learned during my PhD was it opens up your mind, right? And it actually makes you a problem solver, right? You can figure it, figure figure out like what are the problems. You can go for the you can find the gaps very easily, right? And uh, it it actually teaches you the never die attitude, right? Never to give I up. I was going to say I was going to say this. I think the other thing you need to be ready for with this is you need to be committed and be ready to persevere. You, unless you're one of those lucky people that has a perfect project that runs from start to finish, and uh, you know, good luck to them because, you know, if they've managed to get that, then great, fantastic. But yeah. they never get the aspect that we got, which exactly. is that you need to learn how to persevere through sufferance in some ways. Like it's, yeah. it sounds like a very harsh way to say it, but you need to be a very resilient person in the face of the challenges that, you know, you, you come up against. This is something that you, you learn your heart the hard way. Um, a PhD makes you a much more resilient person at the end of it. Um, so when you start this, before you start, just be sure that you're ready to commit. 
that's why it's also really important to make sure that this is something that you are dedicated dedicated to and that you think is right for you because when it gets to that point that you have to be resilient it makes your life easier um so if you've got things that you know um it may get in the way so for example if you maybe have a family like maybe unlike myself and Deepak maybe you came into this process a little bit later in life and maybe you've got a wife and kids or perhaps you've got dependence and other ways like maybe you're looking after your parents or something or you yeah. know there's all things um my advice on that would be to first make sure you're committed and then also make it clear with the supervisor that you've got in charge that these are the challenges you'll face so yeah you know, most project supervisors, if they're really interested in you, you can give them a call or you can give them an email and say, can we have a chat for a little while just to see whether this, you know, and to talk through these things. And you can voice your concerns and make sure that you have something in place so that you can still be committed whilst catering to make sure that balance of life is maintained, that you can you know, keep things going. And if you have a really yeah. good relationship with your supervisors, uh, something dynamic, then you can turn around to them and say, look, actually this week, I, I'm a bit stuck. Um, I don't know. Let's give the example that oh, my my uh, my kids are sick at work and I can't be in this week. And there'll be a lot of responsibility on you that you have to manage it. Because, you know, as long as you keep people in the loop and um, yep. keep the lines of communication open, then people can work towards something in that sense. I'd also say that if you're looking for this kind of PhD, don't expect to be the kind of person that will sit in the back room doing uh, doing nothing and never being bothered you will have to learn communication skills um and yeah it's a good thing it's it's good to be able to come out and talk about your work and to engage with different people and show them what you're doing and show them why it's important yeah um it's 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 one of those things and i think the other thing that i would say to you with these phds if you're looking for and it's it's possibly on the highest scale possible with a coach to phd like um I'm only saying this from the experience that myself and Deepak have seen. We had to be a lot more open. We had to be a lot more open-minded about how we dealt with solution, uh, problems and solutions. We had to be a lot more open-minded with our personal relationships. We had to be a lot more open-minded with our professional work. Um, you need to be ready to be flexible. So if yeah. you're going for this kind of co- you know, PhD, a coach to PhD, just be prepared to face the to unexpected. Deal with, yeah, to deal with the problems. <laughs> exactly the problems yeah 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 okay uh set thank you so much for giving us your time man it was lovely catching no up problem. With you and it was really really very informative yeah yeah sure and hopefully if uh you know look if if anybody wants to ask any comments um just put some comments on the video and i'll get yeah. deepak to send me some and then when that, i have some time yeah. between my busy working life i will um try and give you some little pointers that you maybe you can put back as a response saying this is yeah. what you think like, would be a good answer yeah 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 okay thank you so much guys for watching the entire episode now if you have any questions or if you want me to make a podcast or invite someone for any particular question you can leave your questions in the comment sections and also please like share and subscribe to my channel so that you can get all the information and also please don't forget to press the bell icon see you